Hello, everyone. On behalf of C. Bradley Thompson, Executive Director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for a conversation in honor of Constitution Day. My name is Michael Hoffpower. I am Associate Director of the Lyceum Program and Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science here at Clemson University. The Lyceum Program is a great books program that offers a scholarship to incoming students and a minor to current students of Clemson University. Our curriculum ranges from classical to modern political philosophy to the American founding and to the political theory of capitalism. The Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and its Lyceum program are dedicated to the study of the moral, political, and economic foundations of a free society. Today's conversation fits with our mission of examining the principles and institutions institutions like the United States Constitution that make a free way of life possible. This talk would usually be hosted during family weekend, but because of the pandemic, we are speaking to you today virtually. While we would prefer to see you all in person, of course, we are nonetheless happy to have students, parents, and friends of the CISC join us here. This talk has been made possible with generous support from the Jack Miller Center. We thank them for facilitating our celebration of Constitution Day. Further, we are co-hosting this event with the AEI Executive Council at Clemson University. The AEI Executive Council at Clemson University works to advance campus dialogue about public policy and about the scholarship of the American Enterprise Institute. Throughout this semester, the AEI Executive Council will bring conversations about pressing public policy issues to Clemson. If you are interested in learning more about the Council or other educational opportunities that AEI offers for students, please visit AEI.org or contact Clemson Chapter President Luca Fermento. Email the CISC and we'll be happy to put you in touch with Luca. Before we get to it, I'd like to talk a bit about the format of today's conversation. Our guests, Dr. Yuval Levin, and I will talk a bit before we open up things to a Q&A from you, the audience. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk by typing them in the Q&A box. Our hope is to have this be a conversation not only between Dr. Levin and me, but also between you and Dr. Levin. Now to get to it. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Yuval Levin. Dr. Levin is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at AEI. He also holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy. The founding and current editor of National Affairs, he is also a senior editor of the New Atlantis and a contributing editor to National Review. Dr. Levin served as a member of the White House domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush. He was also executive director of the President's Council on Bioethics and a congressional staffer at the member, committee, and leadership levels. Dr. Levin is author of The Great Debate, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of Right and Left, The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in the Age of Individualism, and he is also author of the book we will be discussing today, A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. He holds a BA from American University, an MA, and a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Welcome. Dr. Levin. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's, it's great to see you. It's, it's, it's strange to start this off and not being able to say, please join me in yes. Dr. Levin. Well, nonetheless- well, One way or another, it's great to be with you. And, and really, I'm a huge admirer of what the Center for the Study of Capitalism does and what you all do at Clemson. So it's, it's an honor for me. Uh, it's a great way to start. Flattery. Thank you very <laughs> much. Look, I, I'd like to start on the surface and, and start with the very title of your book, if you don't mind, A Time to Build, 
from family and community to Congress and campus, how recommitting to our institutions can revive the American dream. So at first I was thinking about asking you about build and yes. say, okay, so it's a time to build. Are we building from nothing? Are we repairing? Are we having to, what are we doing here? But then you say recommitting. And that seems to suggest somehow that there's a sort of rebuilding that needs to occur. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind talking to me about what you would hope your audience would gather just simply from the title of your book. Yeah, thank you. It's, an, it's a nice way to get into the argument of the book because in a sense, I, I wanted that title because this is generally understood as a period of tearing down in our political life, uh, a time when people feel like they are burdened and oppressed by all kinds of, uh, of institutional burdens they want to throw off, and a time when we're all pretty sure what we want to get rid of. And I think we need to th ask ourselves what we want to build and what we want to start and what we want to strengthen and, and vitalize and revitalize. Because ultimately, the, the populist energies that are surging through our politics now, they serve some purpose. They're, they're, they express in an important way a set of frustrations that are very widespread and many of which are justified, but they're not going to be sufficient. And the question for us is, what do we want to construct so as to address the problems we have? Not only what do we need to, what, what swamp needs to be drained or uh, what elite needs to be uh, eliminated, but what do we need to build so that this system works? So then I think from that, you've, you've, you've allowed me now to ask you then, so we need to talk about institutions. Yeah. How is it that we should define an institution and at the same time, could you continue to elaborate on why it is that institutions matter? Yeah, you know, the term institution is so broad and fundamental that it can certainly be hard to define. And there's a range of academic definitions in different disciplines, and I work through some of those in the book. But I would define institutions as the durable forms of our common life. They're the frameworks and structures of what we do together. There's a way of thinking about American life as just a big open space with a bunch of individuals in it. And the problem we have now is that those individuals are having trouble connecting with each other. So we talk about building bridges, tearing down walls, leveling playing fields. I think all these things are important, but they miss something very significant, which is that we don't really operate in the world as loose individuals. There's always a structure, a form to what we do together. And those structures, those forms are our institutions. Some of them are really organizations. They have something like a corporate form, a university or a hospital or a school or a legislature, a uh, company. These are all institutions. They're technically legally formalized. Um, but being an organization like that is not essential to being an institution. There are institutions that are durable forms of a different sort. The family is obviously the first and foremost institution of any society. Uh, you could talk about a, 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 uh, a, a, an academic discipline or a profession as an institution. Uh, you could talk about the institution of marriage. Uh, the rule of law is an institution. What matters about them is that they are durable forms of common action. They give shape to what we do together. They keep that shape over time. And so they form the way we act in the world. They, they define uh, a, a certain kind of way of behaving together. And that's why I would emphasize this concept of form, contour, structure. An institution organizes people into a particular form, moved by a purpose, characterized by a structure, and lets us work together. And that's enormously important, obviously, in, in any society to let us achieve any social good. It's especially important for us now because I think the problems we have in American life are, are characterized by a loss of affiliation and a loss of confidence in institutions. They're a form of alienation. You talk to people now and pretty soon they'll start talking about our country in the third person, uh, about they and their and them and not us and ours and we. And I think that speaks to a kind of alienation that has to do with failures of institutions. And so the book tries to surface this concept of, in, of the institution, which can easily become invisible to us in a free society. Uh, because I think now we have to see our institutions precisely because they need our help. 
So it seems to me that one of the first things you would like your readers to remember or recognize is that we, we exist in some sort of partnership that aims at some good. So you, you're reminding me, of course, of Aristotle in what you just said, the beginning of the politics. There are worse things to remind people of. Yeah, yeah this so, is a very Aristotelian argument, no question about it. And so we have then institutions then seem to serve as something, as some sort of authoritative source or near authoritative source of the good at which all human action might be said to aim. But prior to getting that, that far, I really appreciate your answer there. Prior to getting that far, also, I need to understand better, it seems to me, human beings. Yeah. And, and so I'd like to then ask you that whether or not understanding the importance of institutions is rooted in certain understandings of human beings. And it seems to me in reading your book that you deny the view which holds that human beings are perfectible beings. And rather, you adopt the view that human beings are fallen or inherently flawed. Is this accurate? And what does this then entail for our thinking about what institutions can possibly do? What, you, what you're getting at there is something that I think is vital to grasp, which is that anthropology precedes sociology. We have to think about the human person before we can think about social arrangements. Um, and there is certainly an anthropology that's implicit in what I'm saying here. Um, now, I, I think the distinction isn't necessarily between perfectible and fallen, but the, the, the question is whether human beings begin fallen or not, whether they begin ready to be free and just needing to be liberated, or whether they begin, we begin fallen and imperfect and needing to be formed before we can be free. And that latter view is very much my view. I think the difference between these two is extremely important to understanding our politics. A lot of arguments in our political life implicitly assume that human beings enter the world ready to be free and to thrive in a free society, and we need to be liberated. Uh, you know, Rousseau put it plainly, uh, it, it, men are born free, but everywhere are in chains, and the chains are the institutions of society. He thought that everywhere you look, the strong oppress the weak, and the purpose of a functional politics was to liberate the weak from oppression by the strong. That's not entirely wrong, of course, but it's not entirely right, and it's not sufficient. I think a lot of our politics now is rooted in the sense that what's required of politics is the liberation of the weak from under the boot of the strong. I think what's required is also the formation of every human person so that we can be capable of exercising the kind of responsibility that's required in a free society. We don't start out ready for it. And our institutions form us from the family on. Our institutions shape us so that we're capable of being responsible enough to be trusted with the enormous amount of freedom that our society gives us. So, theref so therefore, the, con the, the actual content of the institution matters. Sure. Um, and so now you've suggested something along the lines of what might be the preferred content of an institution. Is, and so I'd like you to elaborate more on your closing point there, please. Is it, since we've already spoken of Aristotle, is it virtue as Aristotle might have us understand it? Is it responsibility as Publius might have us understand yeah. it? Is it moderation well, as my you know, mom? We live in a free society, and that means that people have the right to differ about that question. And we have a, a diversity of institutions in our society, and sometimes they serve a diversity of moral ends. Um, they have in mind different ideas of what the good is. I do think that we have a broadly shared sense that there's a certain kind of civic responsibility and restraint that's required to be a responsible person. And by the way, that word responsibility is a wonderfully American word. It, it appears to have been coined by James Madison. Um, it appears first in print in Federalist 63, although it's also in Madison's notes on the Constitution, which he wrote before that. And it's not anywhere else before, uh, not in English. And it, it, it appears to be a way of describing our society or what's required for our society to function. Um, and responsibility is very much a part of what the institutions of a free society have to instill in the people if they're going to retain their freedom. Um, I also think that it is a concept that's very closely related to the idea of, of restraint and self-control and discipline that's so essential to Adam Smith and to the underlying theories beneath the market economy and capitalism. 
And it's not by coincidence. This is what it takes to have a free society. Now, there are also institutions with very clear um, normative frameworks. They know what the good is, and they want to instill that in the people within them, whether they're religious institutions or just familial or communal or political or civic institutions. But in our society, we have a diversity of these institutions, and we live with that diversity. It's a good thing generally, not a bad thing. Um, and so I think this concept of the formative institution that shapes the people within it um, doesn't assume a single and absolutely defined notion of virtue, but it does assume our need for virtue and for some kind of civic or I would say Republican virtue. Um, part of what we're losing now, part of the reason why we're losing trust in institutions is that we disagree even about the idea that institutions should be formative at all. And that I think is absolutely necessary for a free society. Excellent, thank you. And you've prompted this next question then. So what is then the current state of our institutions in America? What does it mean? And I'd like to also lead you a little bit more. What does it mean to say that our institutions that were once formative institutions are now performative institutions? Yeah, that's a really core argument of the book. Um, I, I would say the first thing to say about the state of our institutions is that we don't trust them. That's, that's almost a cliche. Uh, there's so much evidence for it that it is taken for granted that Americans have been losing confidence in our institutions for decades. And whether those are the institutions of government or, of, uh, or, or whether they're corporations or whether they're the media or the academy or civil society even, we have been losing trust in our institutions. And that fact should force us to ask, what does it really mean to trust an institution? Part of what it means is just to believe that it's competent and capable of, of advancing the good that it purports to advance. And we have lost some of the sense that core institutions in our society really are competent and capable. Part of it is also a sense that an institution advances some idea of integrity and reliability whether that's in terms of restraining the people within it from uh, corruption, and, and we've lost the sense that our institutions are great at that too, but corruption is always there. I think there's something distinct to our time about the way we've been losing trust in our institutions. And it is that we've gone from understanding some core social institutions in America as formative in the way we've been talking about, to thinking of them as performative, as a place to stand and participate in the theater of our national politics or of our culture war is just another place to yell. And over and over, when you look at our, uh, at our most important social institutions, it seems like people in them now think of them not as forming their character, but as offering them a platform, a, st a place to yell, a place to build a following, to build, a, a, you know, a, 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 to build Twitter followers, uh, or, a, uh, or, or, or get some more prominence in our society. Think about our political institutions. Congress obviously has a purpose, right? But more and more members of Congress now think about the institution as providing them with a platform, with a way to get a better time slot on cable news or on talk radio, a way to be seen and heard channeling the frustration of their voters and less as a way to act from within the institution to advance legislation and change the way our government works. Our president clearly thinks of the presidency as a platform, as a place to stand and be seen saying something. Um, I think you find that in the academy, you find it in the professions. Look, the, 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 the New York Times and Brown University are really different institutions. One of them is a newspaper, one, the other is a university. They're now both places to stand and yell about oppression. And that means that the people within them have lost some essential sense of what the purpose of the institution is. I think you see that across the range of American institutions and it really contributes to that loss of public trust. Well, so then let's continue a little bit more along this line, if you don't mind. So you describe in your book, centralization and the concentration of power within our institutions as leading to a further and further democratization of those institutions and also fragmentation. Is this the inevitable fate of liberal regimes such as our own? Is it inevitable that republicanism, in your estimation, devolve into dysfunctional democracy and ultimately something like tyranny, 
the complete loss of freedom and self-government? I don't think it's inevitable, no. In this sense, I, I don't really take my cues about democracy simply from classical political philosophy. I think that there, there is a genuine advance in the character of the American regime, um, an advance over classical political philosophy. And I don't think that it has to decay into uh, a broken down democracy and then despotism. And more importantly, I think it can recover when it does decay. I think it has the capacity to revitalize itself through a process of reform and, and rebuilding. It's part of why I would call for a period of reform and rebuilding in this moment. And I think that can be achieved by a certain kind of recovery of, uh, of institutional responsibility, of the sense that the, our system of government gives different people in the system different roles and that's an extremely valuable way to resist that sort of centralization of power by creating competing power centers um, and to revitalize the, the, the understanding among the larger population of what our system of government is and is not for. Uh, I think that can be rebuilt over time. And I think we've seen it be rebuilt over time. I think we've seen periods of decay in American political life and cultural life and we have seen periods of revitalization and rebuilding. And so I do have some hope. I would distinguish hope from optimism. I don't think this is just gonna happen. I don't think that if we just sit back, everything will be fine. But hope means that if we act in a way that, uh, that is built on some understanding of the problem, we do stand a chance of improving things. And I do think that that is possible because our system of government, our constitution, is extremely well built to enable that kind of revitalization. It gives us a model to aim for, and especially to resist centralization of power and this kind of, uh, of breakdown into thoughtless, careless democratic rhetoric. Um, it's exactly the set of tools we need. Now, we, it's up to us to use them, but I think they're there for us to use. And, and these, I understand that this is not merely something to be solved in, in, from reading your book in terms of just legally taking care of it. So yeah. it's not just enough, let's, let's just say, if someone were to suggest repeal the 17th Amendment, right. no longer, and make senators come into being through the state legislatures. Yeah. Nor is it enough to somehow turn back the clock on the, what's sometimes called the atomization of Congress, where you have, you know, where it's no longer just underneath a boss party system where everybody's in, in line. It seems to me that that's not enough. Um, from what you just said, and then also from reading your book. But I'm wondering if you could continue to elaborate for us how it is that we might find, I'm just going to stick with hope, hope yep. inside of the Constitution as a political framework and as an institutional framework. And in, in your understanding of those two things, I would like to at least share, I was straight away thinking of Federalist 49 yes. and Federalist 51, respectively. So would you mind talking to us a little bit about how it is that the political framework and the institutional framework of the Constitution might help us in this way? Yeah, that, that's the right place to go. So I would say this, I, I think that those kinds of structural reforms that people talk about are useful. And there are things that I, that I would point to and do point to in the book, where you could change some of the rules that govern Congress, you could change some of the structures we're talking about here, whether by constitutional amendment or not, and those could make a difference. But I think there's a more fundamental issue here that's ultimately about how we as a people understand ourselves and understand our government. And that does require us to think about what the Constitution really is. Um, it's, it's sort of a strange question to ask, but the Constitution is, w we know it as a framework. It's a, it's, a, it's a set of interlocking powers and capacities that enables our government to function. But it's, it's di several different kinds of frameworks at the same time. Our constitution certainly is first and foremost, a legal framework, right? It is, uh, it, it, it describes itself as the supreme law of the land and it is that. It's a text that's enacted that establishes a set of rules that can be put into effect by public officials and can be interpreted by judges in specific cases. The constitution is also uh, a, a policy-making framework, right? It's a set of tools and authorities that allow a government to address practical problems by making laws, by spending money and raising revenue, by creating public programs. The Constitution was adopted 
because the Articles of Confederation that preceded it had failed as a policymaking framework in particular, and it created a better one. We also should think of the Constitution as an institutional framework, as a set of formal bodies, legislative and executive and judicial, um, that each has a distinct structure, each has a distinct character, carries out a different kind of work than the others. And our constitutional system is, is, is the interaction, the interlocking work of these institutions. And finally, as you, as you suggest, the constitution is also a political framework. It's an arrangement of powers that answers to some enduring set of, of moral truths, of understandings of what government is, uh, of what the ends of government ought to be. It sets up a regime that has a particular kind of character and tone and ethic and I think to be a constitutionalist in America is to be a champion of that regime, of an idea of government, an idea of the citizen. That's more than just a written law. And in a sense, it is a recovery of that political character that describes a set of responsibilities of our leaders, but also of ourselves as citizens that needs to be recovered if we're gonna get back to a place where our constitutional system has a chance to work. And that requires us to think more than legalistically about the Constitution. It's not just a set of questions for lawyers, it's a set of questions for citizens. So that when we ask ourselves whether the system is working well, the question shouldn't just be, is what's being done by the actors in this system allowed? It should be, does this really belong in our kind of regime? Is this how the system should work? And it should be, about what's expected of us as citizens, ultimately. I think that that set of questions has been submerged beneath legalism on the one hand and an emphasis on policy on the other hand. And it has to be recovered some if we're gonna be able to recover the character of our system of government. Because ultimately the questions that have to be asked are questions about responsibility. They're questions that start out in a moment of decision by asking what, given the role that I have here, as a member of Congress, as a judge, as a president, as a citizen, given that role, how should I behave in this situation? It is simply clear that our, our constitutional officers don't ask that question now in moments when they clearly should. The president does things that no one who asked that question would ever do. Members of Congress constantly do things that they would not do if they thought, what should a member of Congress do here? Um, judges too. And so, I, and, and it's also true of citizens. And so I, I think we have to recover a sense that is informed by the political character of our society, but also by a recognition of our institutions and what they are that starts us on a path to reform. In order to reform our institutions, we have to begin by recognizing that they're broken and the people within them have to see that. And so that kind of recovery of institutional responsibility has to precede any clever ideas we might have for how to change the rules or amend the constitution. So, so let's just make sure to, if you don't mind, please, to put a, a sharper point on this since we've now spoken about responsibility so much. So it seems, please correct me and help me see if I'm understanding this correctly. So the critique of responsibility as we might find its shadows around now is responsibility as something like mere responsiveness. Yeah in comparison with the responsibility regarding the rights and permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Um, that's Fed 10, of course, right. I'm riffing on there, but yep. something about taking care of that as, uh, and, and looking to that as a component of what representative government as Publius would have us to understand yep. Republican government is key to responsibility there. That's right, responsibility is not just responsiveness. And our institutions are not simply democratic. Our institutions are Republican with a small r. And that means that alongside an obligation to be responsive to the public, which they do have, there is also an obligation that's defined by the character of our system of government. That with the, our constitutional officers, members of Congress, the president, judges, but also we as citizens have an obligation to the larger system to see to it that the vision that underlies it is given effect, is made real. Um, and, you know, that means especially that there are times that call for restraint, for not taking actions that you could legally take. There's a technicality here that says you can do it. But if you think about the structure of our system of government, you shouldn't do it. Um, and so even if you really, really want to change our immigration system, 
if you're only the president and you're not a member of Congress, you can't change our immigration system. Even if there is some vague statute that says the, the secretary shall and seems to give you an awful lot of room, what you're contemplating doing is taking a legislative action. When you announce it by saying, if Congress won't act, I will, you're saying that you're violating the Constitution because there is not a properly legislative action that an executive could also properly take. I think that's part of the problem with what we call the administrative state or the regulatory state is that you have executive and judicial action, you have, sorry, legislative and judicial actions without legislative and judicial forms, an institution, an agency that takes it on itself to act as in, in the place of Congress and the courts is violating the, the, the core structure of our system of government, even if it isn't violating the law, even if a judge can't stop it, we as citizens should see that something is wrong. And I think that that requires an understanding of, of, of institutional responsibility that has to be recovered. Uh, and I think it would also require an understanding of, of ambition. Yeah. Of, of, because now you've allowed me because of the violation of separation of powers, which we, we both will rightly impute to the administrative state, uh, you lead me now to talk about ambition. Um, and this is, of course, against the backdrop of the Constitution. Um, let's just straight from the jump. Is ambition a vice or a virtue? Is ambition both something that is everywhere, but also responsible for this shift from two platforms, as we would say here? Yeah, so ambition is a vice and a virtue. Um, and like most vices, it is a vice when it is a virtue taken to excess or practiced out of its proper framework. Uh, this is also a very Aristotelian way to think about the difference between virtue and vice. Our system depends on a certain amount of ambition, exactly because it puts the institutions in balance so that they each check the others. It requires ambition and it requires, say, a member of Congress to stand up and say, no, you're taking my place here. This is not going to cut it. The problem we have is not that ambition exists, but that ambition now is misdirected and it's misdirected in performative directions. When we think of our, of, of our politics as basically a kind of reality show, so that the purpose is to play the part in that show rather than to play the part in this system, um, then ambition comes to be channeled in the direction of how can I get more prominent? How can I get a bigger following? How can I make more noise? So that if you ask yourself, What's wrong with, say, what uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is doing as a member of Congress? Uh, the answer is not that she's advancing ideas I disagree with. She often does, but that's, she got elected to do that. The, the problem is that she doesn't think as a legislator, but as a performer. She's trying to change the culture by advancing a certain message. And obviously, that's part of what a politician does, but it's not fundamentally the role that the system assigns a member of Congress. I think a lot of members of Congress now are genuinely confused about the role they have in the system. Actual legislating is done by four leaders, uh, roughly. Um, and you know, there are a lot more than four members of Congress. Everybody else kind of stands around and watches it happen. And what they do with their time is basically perform. They get on camera, mostly to complain about Congress. Um, they act as outsiders, even when they're insiders. You wouldn't believe what happens here, you know, what these people are doing, they'll say. And I think, well, I don't know, you've been in the Senate for 35 years, maybe you're one of these people. There's a desire to be seen as an outsider when your job is to be the consummate insider. And again, we see the same thing with the president. Whatever you think of the substantive policy that the president is advancing, he's doing it by acting as an outsider, even though he is the ultimate insider in our system of government. He talks to the government rather than for the government. Um, I think that a lot of what we think of now as judicial activism is also a kind of performance. It's a way of, of, of saying, I'm on the right team, look at me. And if you just read many judicial opinions now, they're basically just virtue signaling. They're, they're, they're playing that same, playing a part in that same culture war that everybody else is trying to participate in. You see it in corporate America, where a corporation feels the need to say what their opinion is about the latest political outrage. And my thought is, you know, you make sneakers. I'm just not interested in what you think about Black Lives Matter. I, it doesn't matter to me. And I'd rather not know, because if it turns out not to be what I think about it, then, you know, now I, I have to look differently at my favorite pair of shoes. That's ridiculous. 
I, I think everybody puts themselves in this position now and thinks of the place where they are in society as a place to stand and yell. And we've got to recover a sense that these places have other purposes than that. Is it, is it simply, and still to, to try and stick with the language of, of Publius here, um, is it something like the love of fame though that's at work in this platforming? Yeah. Is, it, is it something new? Is this all, is the, is the internet to blame? Is Twitter to blame? Or is this just good old fashioned love of, of fame and reputation, for instance, yeah. if John Adams was so concerned? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I'm a conservative. So when you ask me, is this new? I'm gonna say no. Um, and then I'll figure out why. So no, this is not new. Um, and it is absolutely tied up with the love of fame. But I think that it is also a function of a deformation of the love of fame. Our system of government is really built to take seriously that love of fame and to channel it in a direction that encourages responsibility so that the way you earn fame is by doing the job the system assigns you. But our political culture now is such that you earn that fame by playing a part in, in political theater. And that means that that's what these ambitious people are going to do. They're going to earn that fame by playing that role. Um, I think that that's the, that's the distortion and deformation we've seen across the range of American life, not just in politics. It's connected to some technological changes where social media creates a very bizarre kind of fame. It, it, it leads us all to think of ourselves as kind of mini celebrities uh, you know, we all act as our own paparazzi, always uh, denying ourselves privacy and turning everything we do into a performance. And as we experience something worthwhile, we, we ask ourselves how this will look when we post it. Um, that's a bizarre kind of deformation. And I, I think that it extends across the range of American life at this point. And again, it requires a recovery of institutional integrity so that we can recover a sense that we can earn that fame and reputation by playing the part the institution assigns us rather than by playing a part in this larger theater. Yeah, this wonderful way my, my teacher, Michael Yulman used to say, the way that um, these, these institutions can be elastic regarding yeah, right. the person who's, for instance, speaking of the presidency, the way that the person uh, the, 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 the situation the person is in and then however big that person may need to be. Yeah. Um, so I really take your point seriously that you've just made. L let me ask a, a final question before we turn to the audience Q&A to kind of just try and pull this back to a question of liberty. Is it true that there is a tension between strong institutions and liberty? Strong institutions, for instance, might mean less freedom, less transparency, less individualism, but they might also mean more responsibility and more moderation. If this is all right, all correct is what I mean, how might we strike a balance between strong institutions and liberty? Yeah. Absolutely, I think there is a tension there. Um, and again, I'm a conservative, so I think tension is life. Um, there is not a, there is not a perfect unmixed good in this world. Um, and so I think that we always have to understand our political imperatives in terms of tensions. And also in terms of a kind of pendulum, there are times when the problem we have is that institutions are too strong. Uh, you can look, for example, at America in the middle of the 20th century. And what you find there is a culture that is screaming that its institutions are too strong and overbearing. From, uh, th from the culture of the, of the loner and uh, you know, the James Dean movie um, to the emergence of the modern conservative movement. If you read the, the opening editorial of National Review, which we remember for saying that we should stand athwart history yelling stop, most of that editorial was about the danger of bigness and overbearing institutions that compel us all to be conformists. That's what everybody was saying. And that period launched a process of liberalization in the culture and also in the economy, um, which in a lot of ways was very good for us. But that process can go too far. And we live now in a time when in some respects it has gone too far. And if you look at our culture now, 
I think we're not crying out that our institutions are too strong and overbearing. We're crying out that they're too weak and ineffective. And we live in a time that requires us to recover some institutional strength, not because institutional strength is an unmixed good. It, it absolutely can, as you say, uh, compel conformity. It absolutely can undermine transparency. It can enable corruption and it can constrain liberty. But we need some institutional strength and we don't have enough. I think for the conservative, you know, the, the best guide for questions like this is the, the, the concluding lines of, of Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, where he describes himself in this wonderful image as a, a, a man on a ship who keeps running from one side to the other when the ship leans too far to keep it in balance. What he's arguing for is the ship. Um, and to keep it in balance, if you think about our constitutional system as that ship, sometimes that means arguing for presidential power. Sometimes that means arguing for congressional power. Sometimes that means arguing for stronger institutions. Sometimes it means arguing for more personal liberty. We're always arguing, though, for the ship. And I think in this moment, if you ask yourself what's wrong, you would end up arguing for a recovery of some institutional integrity and strength. And that's what I argue for. Excellent. Thank you. So, so now I'm going to turn to some questions that have been offered by the audience, if you don't mind. Uh, it's great. I'm very happy to see the first question uh, on my screen here. It's from a recent graduate of the Lyceum Scholars Program, a young man named Matthew. I'm going to exclude his last name. Uh, he asks, can public policy accomplish the sort of institution building that you prescribe? Or is it mostly the responsibility of those existing within our institutions to rebuild them? Yeah, I think that there's a role for public policy, but it is a supportive role. It's not the leading role. Um, and that in general, by the way, I would say the right way to look at America is not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And that's good news, because if you look at America from the top down right now, you would be inclined to be very pessimistic about the prospects for this country. But if you look at America from the bottom up, I think you'd feel better about it. And it's also how America tends to work. So that it does seem to me that the responsibility for this kind of change that I'm talking about, it begins with a change of attitude, a change of mindset, which is a kind of individual change. Um, it has to advance toward institutional reforms, but those need to begin uh, near at hand. We have to ask ourselves about the institutions that we each play some part in, the university you're part of, the, the church community you're part of, the family that you're part of. Ask yourself, how can we be better at exercising the obligations we have responsibly here? And then demand the same of people in other institutions that are more powerful than those, and ultimately demand the same of our political institutions. There absolutely are some policy reforms that I think would be important. And that's my day job. I work in public policy. We can talk about how Congress should change uh, and about some ways that we might uh, use public policy to help. But those are secondary and they can't be where this begins. And it wouldn't succeed if they were all we did. So I do think the change has to be bottom up. And ultimately effective change in America very often is. Yeah, and I would think that that is your answer is evident in your very actions, because as you reminded us, you work in policy, and yet your solution uh, or or way of trying to deal with this concern you have was to write this book, rather yeah, than yeah. I mean, very often what we need of public policy in this realm is actually that it that it leave open and protect the space in which civil society can work, and so often what I do in my work in public policy is try to restrain government action rather than try to design exactly the right kind of government action. I don't think we're going to have exactly the right kind of national action in this kind of arena. But if we leave that space a little bit more free and open for community institutions, civil institutions, and for states, um, and it, in some respects, at some level also for national action to happen, um, I think that's that's the important role that public policy often can play. There are some reforms at the national level that I'd favor, but they're not the most important things that we need to do. Great. Uh, our next question comes from Garrett. Garrett asks, what institutions should be strengthened and bolstered first and foremost? 
Yeah, the answer to that really for me, and it's exactly because we, of what we just said about thinking about America from the bottom up, the answer to me begins with the family. Um, a society with weak families is a weak society. And in some important respects, our society is now such a society. Not everywhere, not for everyone, but it, it seems to me to be the case that communities that are in trouble are the result of families that are in trouble. And that has to begin uh, with a recommitment to family formation. And there again, I think there's a modest role for public policy. There's a much greater role for both individual personal reform and for communal and religious institutions. Beyond that, at the next level, I think I would have to look at those communal and religious institutions. Look, there are, there are ways in which this process I've described by which formative institutions have become performative is plainly evident in American religious life where institutions that are supposed to be shaping our souls are instead serving as platforms for political performance art. That happens entirely too much. And it happens, frankly, very much on my side of the aisle. I'm on the right and I see it happening all the time. It also happens on the left. Um, and I think there has to be a recovery of kind of fundamental purpose in those institutions. Beyond that, I would look to civic and educational institutions. Obviously, the university in America requires some dramatic reform and rethinking. Um, but, you know, in a sense, what I'm describing to you is my picture of American society, which is this set of concentric rings from the individual and the family outward to community and civil society, outward to our educational and economic institutions, outward to the states and the national government. And each of these rings protects what happens in the one within it. And that's just how our society works. And so I think that's how change would need to happen. Yeah. Uh, our next question is from John. John asks, the military is consistently regarded as a trusted institution, yet it is by nature an autocratic meritocracy. Do all strong institutions need to be authoritarian to succeed? Are there examples of classically liberal trusted institutions? One more. Do we need to build institutions to be autocratic to become trusted again? Well, I think what's important about the military and the reason why it is such an exception, and it is really such an exception when you look at the public opinion data about institutions, the, the military is the only national institution that is more trusted today than it was in the middle of the 20th century. Everything else is far, far less trusted. Now, part of the reason for that is that the military did have a kind of crisis of public trust uh, around the Vietnam era. So those, those numbers were lower then. Um, but a lot of it is that the military has built up the public's trust. And that really gets to exactly the distinction we were talking about between formative and performative. The military is an abjectly formative institution. It is unabashedly formative. So the reason we trust it is not only that it is good at defending us from our enemies, so it is, it's that we can see that it shapes men and women who take their obligations, their duties, their commitment to country, their honor, seriously. We can just see that. When somebody tells you that they went to Harvard, you think maybe that's a smart person, maybe. And it, it, we know that because they got in, not because Harvard made them smart. When someone tells you they went to the Naval Academy, I don't know about you, but I think that's a serious person. And, it's, a, 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 and he or she is a serious person because the Navy made them so. We think of the military as forming serious people. And the military takes that responsibility very seriously. And because we, we see it as a formative institution, we trust it much more than many other institutions. I don't think that a formative institution necessarily has to be autocratic, though at some level institutions tend to be autocratic. Um, but you know, I, I think that it's possible for the university to function this way, and some universities do, the most don't. Um, and to understand themselves as fundamentally formative in a way that is evident to the public as taking itself seriously. You can see greater public confidence, for example, in local government than in the national government. And that's not, local government's not autocratic, but we have a sense that people who work in local government are a little bit more serious about their actual jobs. And they're not just out there putting on a show, generally, although that too has been changing uh, in recent years. So to me, it seems more important that the institution be seen as plainly formative towards some idea of integrity um, than that it be particularly autocratic. 
Very good. Uh, our next question comes from a Lyceum scholar, uh, Matthew. Does the strengthening of institutions, especially government, go against the fundamental individualistic philosophy upon which America was founded? Yeah, well, I think the philosophy upon which America was founded is a little more complex. Um, there is certainly a great deal of individualism in that philosophy. There is also what I would think of as small r republicanism there. Um, and that republicanism involves a kind of commitment to civic virtue that requires strong institutions and that assumes strong institutions. So I think our political tradition is complicated. Um, and you know, within it, it contains a variety of different forms of liberalism. And it also contains some pre-liberal uh, ideals, including a Republican ideal. So that the tradition itself gives us a lot of tools to work with in a time like this. There is a tradition of individualism. Um, there is also a, a real tradition of communitarianism, which is very evident in the founding era, uh, and which in some ways has always been with us. Um, and so I, I think that the that our politics is actually a working out of some of the tensions within our political tradition, which is simultaneously both progressive and conservative. Um, and so I, I think that the tools for this kind of strengthening of institutions can be found within our tradition, but so can the enormously significant place of individualism and individual rights and choice be found in that tradition. Good, thank you. Um, ah, uh, my peer, Dr. Adam Thomas has a question. Uh, what specifically political reforms as opposed to changes in our habits of thought, do you see as most important for the near-term recovery of this conception of responsibility within our institutions? Yeah, so political reforms would be useful for political institutions, and I do think that there are some such reforms. The, the biggest problem we face in our constitutional system now, I think, is the weakness of the Congress. Um, a lot of the other problems we face are functions of that one. So when we think about an overbearing president, when we think about an activist judiciary, I think those are both responses to the vacuum created by an underactive Congress, where members of Congress now often don't want to take responsibility for tough votes. They don't want to play their core part, which is a, the central part in our system of government. They're the first branch for a reason. And I think that this dereliction of responsibility on the part of the Congress is the biggest problem to be solved so that my reforms begin with congressional reforms, with reforms of the budget process, which is at the center of how Congress functions and now has a lot to do with deforming the Congress. I think that process should be broken down into much smaller pieces that give many more members a role, a job to do day to day. Uh, the budget process has become basically a once a year vote on a big bill that no one seems to have written. Um, and the, the system can't really function that way. I think we need to break down the barrier between authorization and appropriation in Congress so that the committees that make the laws also spend the money, uh, especially in a Congress without earmarks, without these sorts of uh, directed individual spending bills uh, just doesn't need the appropriation process we have and it does a lot of harm. Um, I also think that there needs to be that there need to be changes that empower committees and disempower leaders to some degree. Uh, I also argue in the book that we need less transparency in Congress and go try to make that argument on C-SPAN by the way that was an interesting experience. Um, I, I think that every institution needs some inner sanctum where it really does its work. And especially an institution built on bargaining as Congress is, needs a place where members can actually engage with each other. There's no such thing as bargaining in public. Um, and so I think committees need an opportunity to do some of their work in private, even though the floor should be on television and committee hearings with witnesses can certainly be televised. I think there's a need for more privacy and less transparency in Congress. Um, all of these are ways of strengthening the institution in the direction of channeling the ambition of its members toward legislation. Uh, you know, there are also certain kinds of, of electoral reforms that it seems to me would make sense. I, I'm in some ways an unusual conservative because I actually favor a lot of the electoral reforms that you find more often on the left. I think that rank choice voting would strengthen our system for, con for, for congressional seats. Uh, that multi-member districts, as we used to have in the House, would be a great idea again. 
And the reason is that these would empower factions within the parties that could reach out and engage in cross-party legislative processes so that the, the leaders are less important and members work together in groups and think about what they want and not just what their party needs from them. I don't think we can really have functional third parties in our system, but I think empowering factions within the parties again, which is how our system has usually worked, uh, would help us get back to a functional legislative process. So I could go on. That is, as I say, my day job, but yeah. these kinds of reforms are where my, uh, where my ideas would point. Good, thank you. Uh, our next question is from another Lyceum scholar, Emma Lane, asks, American history is rich in activism performed by non-politicians. Under freedom of speech, citizens are given this right to activism. If activism by celebrities and businessmen is impermissible, what platform should civilians use? What platforms will be effective enough? Yeah, let me draw a distinction there between activism and reform, or rather between activism and performance, let's say. Because when you say activism, you say freedom of speech, you say what platform can people be heard from, but activism isn't just speaking. Um, and effective activism is reform. That is, it's institutionally minded. The civil rights movement, which is surely the most effective and important of the, uh, of, of the examples of activism you could point to, or the abolition movement, which it grew out of, these weren't just protest movements. They weren't just people saying they didn't like the way things were. They were movements that were aimed explicitly and specifically at reforms of our system of government. They interacted with the institutions and engaged with them. The March on Washington wasn't just a lot of people expressing their opinion. It was a way of showing that these people could also turn up on election day. So you should listen to them. I think the kinds of marches we have now don't really do that. They're ephemeral, they're expressive. Uh, you know, a, 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 a simply social media movement where people put, put their thumb up and say, I agree with that, whatever that happens to be, just isn't interacting and engaging with our institutions. And so I think we have to recover an idea of activism that is connected to the institutional structure of our system of government. And that tries to change the law, that tries to change the way our government works, if that's its purpose, if it is ultimately political activism. Too often now we think that when we get on Facebook and say, I agree with that guy, we've done something but you haven't done anything. And th to, to spend our energies that way is a waste of our energies. I think we have to think about how to create enduring activism, ways of actually turning our opinion into action that changes something in the world. And that's not just about politics. That I think in general, we have to think about how to engage with institutions because if all we're doing is expressing our opinions, we might feel better after we do it, but we haven't really achieved anything. Uh, last question, uh, Dr. Levin. Uh, this is from Dr. Derek Duplessis, my friend. Uh, he asks, is the weakness of Congress the cause or the effect of the hyper-political polarization of the constituencies they purport to represent? Yeah, it's both. Um, that's the trouble. Uh, I think it's a great question. It's a very important question because it really matters whether what you're trying to solve um, is basically polarization in the public or polarization in the institutions. And there's a long running debate about this in, in American political science. Um, and there certainly are people, uh, Mo Fiorina at Stanford is a great example, who will just argue that the, the polarization is entirely in the elites and the public is fine. This is about the institutions and it's about political elites. I don't think that's right, or at least I don't think that's right anymore. Um, Congress is in some ways the cause the way that it works leads us to think in a particular way about elections and about what to expect of our politics and, and what to demand of our politicians. It's also, of course, the effect. It's responsive to changes in, uh, in public attitudes and members of Congress wanna get reelected and they think they can do that by performing. Now, I, I think that it's also the effect of certain kinds of changes in the structure of the system. Campaign finance reform since the 1970s has done enormous damage to our political system. It's been very misguided, I think, about what the nature of the problem to be solved is. And it has empowered small activist groups at the expense of the parties, which are actually moderating influences in our system. The parties need to build big tent coalitions 
and they do that by moderating their members and broadening their appeal. We now, because members basically raise their funds from small issue groups, they have no reason to moderate and broaden. They're just appealing to those narrow constituencies, and that has to do with the polarization of our politics. I, I think the, the, the more significant question actually isn't whether it's cause and effect, but where can we make a change? Where can we enter into this cycle and begin to move things in a different direction? And I think that calls for some reforms that are bottom up and it calls for some reforms that are top down as we've talked about. Good, well, thank you very much. Look, I, I apologize to everyone. We have more good questions than we have minutes today. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I'd like to thank uh, the AEI Executive Council for their help in putting this together. I'd also very much like to thank the Jack Miller Center for their continued support. I'd also like to thank, of course, the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and the Lyceum Program for all of their help in putting this together. And then finally, of course, thank you very much, Dr. Levin, for joining thank us you. today in this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a good evening.